This is Mrs. Palmer Quay with the second video for Unit 14. This video will cover the topics of nutrition and metabolism. Nutrition gets us into the subject of food, and food is necessary because it provides us two things. It gives us fuel to power all of our activities, and then the materials, the raw materials that we need to build ourselves, the structural components for growth and repair of the human body. When we use the word nutrient, we're talking about essential chemical substances that are only found in food. They're not something we can make. The essential word means that we have to take them in from someplace else. They have to come from our environment. And they can be divided into two larger groups, the macronutrients of carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, and the micronutrients of vitamins and minerals. Water also could be on this list because it is pretty essential for health, too. Most foods do contain several nutrients. It's rare to have a food that only has one thing in it. When we're talking about food, we also talk about calories, but calories are not a nutrient. Calories are a way we measure the energy present in the food, which ties back to the idea of fuel, while the nutrients, we can think of them as providing the structural materials. So let's start with carbohydrates. Hopefully you are remembering that carbohydrates provide energy, and specifically it is the energy in their chemical bonds that when broken by our various metabolic processes, actually by catabolism, that specific little part of metabolism, um, but it is that energy that is released that's then captured into ATP and used to power all of our other cellular things that are going on, all the other processes. Taking in too many carbohydrates can lead to obesity, cavities, or nutritional deficiencies because of it overpowering some of the other needed foods. And not having enough carbohydrates, of course, would lead to weight loss or a situation known as metabolic acidosis, where the, there's too much acidity in the body. The pH has become too low in the blood. We don't know if there's a minimum daily requirement for carbohydrates, but it seems that an intake, intake of about 125 to 175 grams a day is sort of a baseline. It's very, very easy to get much more than that, so it usually isn't a concern that someone is not taking in enough carbohydrate when you're talking about good nutrition. Furthermore, carbohydrates come as simple or complex form, and sometimes the complex are divided further into refined and unrefined forms. Simple carbohydrates are monosaccharides and disaccharides, so our disaccharides are lactose in milk sugar or sucrose in cane from cane sugar canes and from sugar beets, and also molasses, which comes from sugar cane. Then monosaccharides are things like fructose, especially that you find in honey and your fruits, um, also glucose itself and galactose. Complex carbohydrates are all polysaccharides, but they can be found either as starch from the plant foods or glycogen, which is the starch form found from animal foods. It's a way of putting together along chains of glucose, remember, to make a complex carbohydrate a better storage form. In digestion, we break these complex carbohydrates down into monosaccharides, and then the monosaccharides are what are absorbed, as you should remember from the previous video for this unit. Cellulose is another type of complex carbohydrate, but we're not able to digest it. The bacteria in our large intestine can break it down a little bit, but it basically serves as fiber, which is also sometimes called, called roughage. It provides a bulk um, just takes up space as the food moves through the digestive system. It helps move the waste products through the digestive system. It helps absorb water to bring it in to keep things moist in the feces. The fiber also can be further divided into soluble, which is water-soluble, and insoluble forms. The insoluble forms, of course, are going to stay inside the large intestine. The soluble forms um, are the kind that would then be able to move into the bloodstream. There's some controversy on whether the soluble um, fiber from oatmeal helps in lowering LDL levels. Um, there's some conflicting information, but it, it just might. And so that's a uh, since it's one that becomes soluble or, or fiber that is soluble and that can move out of the intestine can possibly have other beneficial effects. 
Once digested, glucose moves into the bloodstream, and as a response to the glucose, we see an increase in insulin secretion because insulin is necessary for the glucose to move into most body cells. So that diets that are high in simple sugars, things that are monosaccharides or disaccharides that then very quickly go to be absorbed, they lead to a more rapid blood glucose and insulin response. The problem with that, as we see in this first little diagram here, is that not only do you have a high production of insulin, but you also often then have an overcompensation and a falling of blood glucose. And I hope you have a sense that our body with homeostasis is really trying to keep everything very carefully regulated, and big jumps and changes are really not good for the body. It puts extra stress on things, and you can have symptoms. People can have symptoms of being coming off a sugar rush and feeling dizzy or perhaps having a headache um, at either end of this spike, either when things are very high or very, very low. So that if you are eating complex carbohydrates, things that are more slowly digested, you don't get as high of a spike of blood glucose and then the corresponding response from insulin. And you also don't get that um, overcompensation at the end that, that causes blood glucose levels to go down below sort of the optimal point. So because the complex carbohydrates are more slowly digested and have a more moderate effect on blood glucose level, the recommendation, of course, is to have more complex carbohydrates as your choices. And when I'm talking complex carbohydrates, I'm saying uh, primarily the ones that have more of the whole food, the whole fruit, the whole vegetable, the whole grain in them. With the grains, we've got a lot of refined carbohydrate foods. They're, they're starches, the pastas and breads and such, but they're not, um, they're sort of in between these two charts here. They are fairly quickly broken down, but they're, um, so they're not, they're not quite as bad as having the simple sugars as the first choice, but they're not as good as a more whole grain or a whole fruit or vegetable product. Moving on to lipids, lipids are fats and oils, which we eat as dietary triglycerides, that's the word we use, and then other fat-like substances, such as our phospholipids found in cell membranes and cholesterol, which of course provides the base molecule for many of our sex hormones. Fats or lipids supply energy for cellular processes and are also part of structures like cell membranes. So all of these, um, the carbohydrates and the lipids and the proteins, all are part of the energy cycle. They all can provide energy. But while carbohydrates primarily are an energy source, lipids have this other role of being part of structural components. Excess intakes of lipids can lead to obesity, increased cholesterol, um, deficiencies, of course, can lead to weight loss and then hormone imbalances if the cholesterol is not there to make sex hormones, and even a number of skin conditions can be related to a too low lipid uh, content of the diet. The American diet is extremely rich in fats. That's sort of the standard American food choices. There's no problem getting enough lipids, and so we're actually recommended to limit how much intake to less than 30% of total calories coming from fats and oils. Lipids can be found from both plant-based and animal-based foods. So anything that, that um, will produce an oil from your plants, various seeds and nuts, will give you oils, and so they are a source of lipids. And then, of course, you see fat visibly on meat and uh, on cream, if you have uh, cream that rises up or lard from pig fat, so that, that we get them both from plant and animal-based foods. We do need a certain essential amount of fatty acids, the, the components of lipids, but we're really talking just a few tablespoons a day, and so they are, that's well below the 30% of calories from fat. The lipids can be further broken down into saturated and unsaturated forms. So I just want to talk a little bit about those particular designations. The um, unsaturated fats, as we come over here looking at this diagram in the center of, of the second picture, are made up of single bonds. Lipids or fatty acids are made up of a long carbon chain that have hydrogens attached to the carbons. And you see in the saturated fat that every single bond is a single bond. All the carbon has been filled with hydrogen. Saturated fats tend to be um, fairly solid at room temperature and have had a kind of a bad reputation for many years as potentially contributing to heart disease, they probably are not quite as much of a problem as had been thought previously. We've now put our focus more on trans fat and avoiding processed foods. 
the saturated fat in comparison to that you can have an unsaturated fat so just to the left here we have a mono unsaturated fat and that is a fat that has one double bond and you can see that we've got uh, one place here where you could have two more hydrogens there's a space available for them but in between the two carbons there is a hydrogen or there is a double bond instead monounsaturated fats are found in such foods as uh, olive oil of course peanuts avocados almonds and they're all considered fairly beneficial fats for you to eat try to incorporate these in your diet Polyunsaturated fats would have more than one double bond in it. I don't have a picture of one of those. And so the position of the first double bond is where we get these titles of omega-3 versus omega-6 and omega fats, omega-9 when we're talking about fatty acids. So the omega-3 fatty acids are ones where the first double bond is three carbons in from a particular end of the, um, the methylated end. And these are the fats that are found in fish, as well in some plant products such as flaxseed, soybeans, walnuts, and rapeseed oil, which um, I, I'm not sure why that's on there because we don't eat the original rapeseed oil. We eat the canola oil, the new variety of it, and it's actually higher. I think this, this particular one should be long over here because it has more monounsaturated fats than um, polyunsaturated fats. But anyway, canola oil, the, the botanical name of that is rapeseed. And then the omega-6 fatty acids are the most common fats that are used in processed food products. So sunflower oil and safflower oil are um, often used. You can see them listed in the various packaged goods, uh, soybean oil to some extent. And so in our diet, we tend to get in general lots and lots of these omega-6 fatty acids, and we have to work hard at taking in more omega-9 or omega-3s. We want to really have a balance of all types of fatty acids, and so it's a good idea to try to incorporate more of these foods that are giving you mono and saturated fats and these foods that will give you the omega-3 fats. There's really nothing to worry about when it comes to the omega-6 fats. You probably are getting enough of those already. We also hear a lot about trans fats. And so this final picture over here on the right shows that when the double bond in a trans fat is formed, the two hydrogen end up on opposite sides from each other. If you see on this, the two hydrogen of uh, on the double bond or on the same side. This is known as the cis formation in this unsaturated fat. But in the trans fat, they are across from each other, and that's where we get the trans name from. A uh, cis formation of an unsaturated fat tends to be a more bent molecule because these two hydrogens are repelling each other, and so they're pushing the molecule down. Whereas a trans fat, the hydrogens are already as far apart as they need to be, and so that keeps a, the molecule in a more linear shape. And you should know by now that the shape of the molecule will determine functionality to a great extent. And these fatty acids that are in a more straightened shape, a more linear shape, uh, somehow that is causing a more detrimental effect to the body, leading to more plaque buildup in arteries and just uh, you know, greater risk of heart disease. And so now there's, there's a much greater concern about getting trans fats out of the food supply and avoiding them in your own food choices. When it comes to numbers and chemical formulas, they look like exactly the same as the naturally occurring cis formation, but it does not act in the body the same way. Shape is crucial. Then moving on to proteins, the third major energy supplying nutrient. Um, Protein has a very important role in providing the structure of our bodies. We've talked about so much about how we are made up of protein, the, the connective tissue and the various cells, you know, our, our protein is just everywhere. Enzymes, specific proteins that cause metabolic processes to happen, they are, they are catalysts. Without them, things would not happen at the speed that it needs to. Um, your hormones are proteins, and of course, hormones are sending signals of all types all over your body. And then plasma protein we talked about when we talked about the blood, both ones that are involved in the immune system and ones that help regulate osmotic pressure to bring fluid back into the capillaries from the interstitial space. So those roles of protein are, are their primary job, but also protein can provide energy, can provide uh, fuel for the body. Just like everything else, too much protein can lead to obesity, too much weight, but not having enough protein can lead not only to weight loss, but muscle wasting and anemia and growth retardation. You, know, you cannot grow and build a body if you don't have protein there for raw materials. 
Most people could, should consume about 60 to 150 grams a day, or if you take your weight and divide it in half, that gives you a rough idea about how many grams of protein you need, and it's a good idea to spread it out through the day, have some protein with breakfast and some protein with lunch and some protein with supper instead of just loading it up on one meal. Protein is a polymer of amino acids. Hopefully you remember that from earlier modules. And so there are 20 types of amino acids that are involved in making things, structures in the human body. Um, I believe there's about 500 types of amino acids overall. So we only need a tiny, tiny piece of that. And of those 20, eight are essential. There are eight that we cannot manufacture from other components that can come in. Our liver cannot make eight of them. So those are considered eight essential amino acids that we need to get in from the food. Proteins that are coming from animal-based products, meats, fish, poultry, cheese, milk, eggs, they contain all of the essential amino acids in a good ratio. And so it is known as a complete protein. Whereas plant-based foods do not have a good ratio. They are unbalanced in one or more of the essential amino acids. So they're known as incomplete proteins. These amino acids are not missing. They're just not there in quite enough uh, quantity to be able to provide enough raw materials. But with plant-based foods, the different categories of plant-based foods are complementary. So that if you combine something like nuts and seeds with grains or legumes and grains, so you know nuts and seeds with grains, uh, something like sesame seeds on a piece of toast or legumes and grains, you know, beans and rice, these create a complementary setup for what is missing in the nuts and seed food group is in there in plentiful amount in the grains. Nuts and seeds and legumes are another combination. Legumes are things like peanuts and soybeans, um, plants that are able to fix nitrogen for, um, by having a symbiotic relationship with bacteria on their roots. And so the, the, um, Various types, peas or another type, various types of, of vegetables are actually technically called a legume. And so if you are eating a wide variety of plant foods, the proteins and the amino acids will sort of be assembled throughout the day and you'll be fine. You'll be able to get a complete protein. And so that is why people who are on, you know, choosing to eat a vegetarian diet don't have to worry about their protein because if as long as they're eating a variety of plant-based foods, they will be getting the eight essential amino acids in the right proportion. There are lots of different types of vegetarians, so I just want to kind of go over some of the categories here. A vegan is the most strict category. This is a person who is not going to eat, and on this list we've got things they don't eat, would not eat honey or dairy products or eggs or meat byproducts, fish, poultry, uh, you know, of any type. So a vegan would be someone who's strictly plant-based products only. A lacto-vegetarian, lacto refers to milk, so they would be... Um, comfortable eating dairy products, so this missing space here means yes, they would eat it, as well as honey. Vegans tend to not use anything produced by any uh, animal creature. An ovo-vegetarian, ovo there's referring to eggs, so they would be comfortable eating eggs but not milk. A lacto-ovo-vegetarian would be comfortable eating eggs and milk. A polotarian, this is referring to chicken, so they're comfortable eating poultry as well as eggs and milk. And a pescatarian is comfortable eating fish as well as eggs and milk. And so we've got several varieties. Sometimes this is for um, philosophical reasons. Sometimes it's for health reasons that somebody would choose to eat a diet that doesn't use any animal products or very, very limited animal products. This chart points out some of the things that might be missing if you are restricting the diet in any way. Um, <clears throat> the only thing that, and, and also then gives you places that you can look to substitute. And so really, uh, with a little bit of careful planning, it's not a, a big problem if you want to restrict your diet if, because you're vegan or because of other uh, reasons. If there's a certain food you have an allergy to, that you can't tolerate it, you know, it, it's not uh, a terrible situation. But the one thing, if you are avoiding animal products, um, vitamin B12 is a vitamin that you need to be concerned about. You see it listed in both of these places because it is only found from animal products. You cannot find a substitute that is plant-based for B12. And so you would have to take a supplement or I believe Brewer's yeast can also provide you with B12. 
And this is one that you um, is just a little more difficult for people that in the olden days that were using a vegetarian. Uh, the Hindu population has been vegetarian for centuries, but their food supply probably had a few insects in there, and so that was enough to give the vitamin B12, and so it wasn't really an issue. But for modern-day food supply, for people eating the American diet and being vegan, it would be a concern that you would want to make sure that you are getting B12 because that is something that you can't find a plant substitute. For most everything else, you can find a fairly good and easy substitute um, so that it just doesn't become an issue. Since the carbohydrates, proteins, and fats are the nutrients that provide us with energy or provide us with calories, I want to just talk briefly about energy expenditures. So when we're talking energy, we're talking calories because calories are a way we measure energy. Specifically in chemistry, you know, we're measuring heat with calories. But um, so far as we're concerned, we're talking about calories for energy for our bodies, powering our body processes. Not enough calories can lead to death by starvation, and too many calories can lead to obesity. And so we've got a picture over here. These are MRI of a 120-pound woman as compared to a 250-pound woman. And you can see that when you put on excess weight, excess fat, because you're taking in more calories than you are expending, it goes primarily in the subcutaneous areas. You can see underneath the skin here and around the abdominal organs. And so that's a very clear picture of how things are, will get laid down when you put extra fat on the body. You also might take a look at comparing the knees of this 120-pound person to the one of 250. I think you can imagine that the knee joints there do uh, have a bit more stress, and you can see the ankle joints here. This you know, one seems to be bowing out a little bit more because of the uh, challenges of that bone supporting that amount of weight. So just to reinforce that all of these things can provide cal can provide energy, can provide calories, we're starting up here. Carbohydrates, of course, uh, can go down. We're going working our way down to the citric acid cycle or the Krebs cycle. And so this is showing that what happens to the glucose, well, it goes into glucose 6-phosphate, which then to pyruvic acid, to acetyl-CoA, to the citric acid cycle, and out to the you know, electron transport chain that gives us all that ATP. But we can enter in on this level of acetyl-CoA with fats and lipids. So fats and lipids are broken down into fatty acids and glycerol. The, then those um, can then go right into the Krebs cycle at the level of acetyl-CoA. Also over here in proteins, the amino acids can also enter in at the acetyl-CoA, or they can enter in as pyruvic acid if you've taken off the nitrogen. So the amine group, the NH2, is removed from the amino acids, leaving just a backbone of carbon and hydrogen and oxygen. The amine NH2 is turned into ammonia NH3, which is then sent into the urea cycle, which we will get into when we talk about the excretory system. And that is a way to make urea out of ammonia, because ammonia is toxic, so we don't want that to build up. So that this is just to reinforce the fact that these three main nutrients, carbohydrates, proteins, and fats, all can feed into the, carb the citric acid cycle, and that is the metabolic process that makes ATP by the electron transport chain, and because of that, this is, they are all contributing to making energy for our bodies to be used. So when we're measuring the energy value of food, we're using calories, and calories is a measure of how much heat is needed to change the temperature of water, how much heat is given off. Um, it uses a, it, in the scientific laboratory, it's food calories are determined by a bomb calorimeter, which I've given an illustration of here on the right. And if you were in chemistry class with me, we did do some um, calorimetry experiments. So for every gram of carbohydrate, we get about four calories given off. The same is true for protein, but every gram of a lipid gives near, over twice that, um, nearly 10 calories per gram, definitely at least 9. And so you can see why having a high level of lipids in your food choices can be very devastating when it comes to calorie count because it's got a high calorie density. It does not take very much volume to give you a whole lot more calories. 
how much calories do you need? How much energy do you need? Well, it depends on your basal metabolic rate or your resting metabolic rate, which is the amount of calories that you need when you are at rest, how much energy you need to support the activities of the various organs in your body, the temperature regulation that you need, and you know, digesting your food or wiggling your toes or whatever. Your basal metabolic rate, though, is determined individually. It depends on your gender, your body size, your normal body temperature, how that's maintained, maintain, what endocrine function is going on. If you're a woman that's in a menstrual cycle, certain times in your cycle you're using more energy than other times. And so this gives you your basal metabolic rate. That's sort of the baseline then you need more energy if you're doing anything that uses your muscles, any type of activity. Uh, depending upon the outside environment temperature, you may need a little extra calories to maintain your body at a temperature. And if you are growing because you are still young or you are growing a child because you are pregnant, you will need more energy. So that we are all existing in a state of energy balance. On one side, we have the intake, our calories from food, and on the other side, you have your output, that the calories that are used for the various energy needs that we have, either resting or added on to that. And depending upon which side of this balance has a, a greater expenditure, then that will determine whether you are in a situation that gains weight, or you are losing weight, or you are maintaining your weight. And it's really just calories in and calories out. There's no magic formula. But determining what someone's desirable weight is, is tricky. Um, there used to be the old height, the height weight charts, and you, are you, you know, small boned or medium or heavy framed. Um, now we tend to use the body mass index as a way to calculate, which compares weight versus height considering the surface area of the body. So the body mass index then will say, is somebody underweight or are they abnormal weight, overweight, or obese? Obesity occurs when someone is more than 20% above their desired weight or they have a BMI over 30. There are specific BMI charts for uh, children of different ages and men and women. I have a combined one for adults on the next slide. So this shows if you, the uh, bottom yellow section would be an underweight area, then we have abnormal weight, overweight or obese, and so you would take someone's weight, like my weight is 135, and so we go over here and compare it to my height, which is about 5'6", and you see that I end up right here in the middle of the normal weight. Um, the BMI here, it says 18 and a half to 25. That's because it's combined adult men and women. I, if I look at a chart that just has women, which I have done, I know that I'll come up at about 23%. So for a man, the... Um, percent fat is probably closer to 18 and for a woman then you know it's or it would be the, the lower end of the range and for the woman it would be the higher end of the range because men in general have more muscle mass um, you know less curves on their bodies so as I said your basal metabolic rate is influenced by your age your gender your thyroid hormone action for con especially for maintaining body temperature if you think about that mice experiment we did and the amount of muscle mass that you have because it's going, the greater number of muscles will be requiring a greater amount of ATP. Very restrictive diets, less than 1,000 calories a day, actually lower the basal metabolic rate. It sets the body into, especially after about three days, it, it sets up the body to thinking that it is starving, and so everything gears down. So a very low-calorie diet is not a good idea if you're trying to lose weight. Exercise will temporarily increase the basal metabolic rate, but it's only temporary. So about the only thing that might have an impact on your basal metabolic rate or your resting metabolic rate, I wrote it here, RMR, is the increasing the muscle mass. But in reality, the research is not all that sure whether building more muscle fibers in your muscle cells actually does increase your basal metabolic rate. Theoretically, having more muscle fibers means you need more ATP to contract that muscle, and if you are, you know, working it harder and then of course you're using more of the, those muscle fibers and so you could increase that um, resting metabolic rate but we're not quite sure. So the bottom line is that your metabolic rate is essentially beyond your voluntary control. Don't believe the things you read on the web or the various uh, promotional things you might you know get in the mail from various health magazines that uh, 
the best way to lose weight is to become more active and to be careful about what you eat. You're not going to be able to take a magic bullet and suddenly be able to burn off hundreds of more calories a day. And just to further make the uh, situation you know, depressing, this is how your metabolic rate changes over time. Um, as you are getting older, you know, you're, you can see you are already, I know you're all fairly young, but you're already on the downward slide. Your, meta, your metabolic rate is less now than it was when you were 10 years old. And as you continue to age, it gets less and less, which is why you want to get wiser and wiser about your food choices as you get older. Now we're going to go on to the other nutrients. These are ones that do not provide calories, so they have nothing to do with energy balance, but they are important because they keep you healthy in other ways. Vitamins are large organic compounds, and they are used to be part of, they are part of normal metabolic processes, often as coenzymes. They also often work together with enzymes, allow enzymes to do their job in the various things that are going on inside us. Since vitamins cannot be synthesized by the body, they are an essential nutrient that we have to take in by food, and they can either be ones that are fat-soluble, vitamins A, D, E, and K, or water-soluble, the various B vitamins and vitamin C. Fat-soluble vi vitamins dissolve in fats, and because of that, they can be stored in the body, which can be an issue. Bile salts are important for bringing the vitamins in because they are what allow our bodies to absorb fat, so of course bile salts would be involved in absorbing fat-soluble vitamins. The fat-soluble vitamins are fairly resistant to heat, so you don't have to worry too much about them being destroyed by cooking processes. If you only eat cooked food, you're not going to uh, run the risk of not getting enough of vitamins A, D, E, and K. But because these can be stored in the body, if you are, especially if you are taking supplements, if you're taking vitamin pills, you can put too much in that does not get excreted out because it will get stored in the adipose tissue. And there have been cases of various toxicity. Vitamin A is probably the most problematic one that I've read about. It can cause liver damage, heart valve calcification, bone softening, and a number of other conditions. Um, vitamin D, they haven't had very clear links for a uh, o overdosing on vitamin D. Vitamin K is involved in producing um, prothrombin, and so that's involved in blood clotting, and so having too much vitamin A can influence your clotting rates. Water-soluble vitamins include the various B vitamins, thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, vitamin B6, vitamin B12, and vitamin C. And these are ones that are affected by cooking high temperatures, and so the um, in order to get B vitamins and vitamin C, you do need to include a certain amount of you know, minimally cooked or raw foods in your diet. Foods that are fortified with vitamins, as you find it on uh, breakfast cereals, you know, contains eight essential vitamins and minerals, those are often added after the bulk of the cooking process has happened so they won't break down. B vitamins have a number of roles in cellular metabolism, and so we call them as the vitamin B complex. Vitamin C is involved in maintaining healthy collagen. Uh, one of the side effects or one of the symptoms of scurvy of not having enough vitamin C is that the collagen would start to fall apart and old wounds would reopen. There is some toxicity reported. I told you already about my father who has suffered nerve damage from a vitamin B6 overdose. Um, vitamin C has been implicated in kidney stones, though in general the water-soluble vitamins, because they're water-soluble, will be excreted from the body when too much is taken in. I have read also of a rebound toxicity where someone has been, with vitamin C especially, when someone has been taking large amounts of vitamin C and then consequently they've been excreting large amounts of vitamin C. If they stop having the intake that's so high, their body takes a little bit of time to adjust and so they're still dumping out too much vitamin C initially and that might put them into a deficiency state. I've also read about it happening with babies um, because of their mother taking high amounts of vitamin C prenatally, the baby is born and goes into a deficiency state because it had been used to having so much vitamin C present. And then minerals. Minerals are elements, inorganic elements, those from the periodic table that are essential for human metabolism. We see them especially in the electrolytes, the various ions that we've been talking about all along, and of course as part of the matrix in our bones and our teeth. 
We usually get minerals because we are eating plant-based foods, because the plants pull the minerals out of the soil. They're coming from the rocks that are all around us. And then they are part of these larger organic molecules. So phospholipids have phosphate, hemoglobin has iron, you have iodine in thyroxine and various thyroid chemicals. It is possible to get a mineral toxicity, especially of the heavy metals. If you've heard of lead um, poisoning or you know, some of these, these heavy metals can become an issue because someone has been exposed to pollutants, the water has not been sufficiently cleaned, um, certain drugs will cause you to, to develop a holding on to certain minerals, and sometimes just the, just the various chemicals that we are exposed to can lead to a toxicity of minerals. Minerals can be divided into groups, the, the major minerals where we've got, uh, we need much more of them. So the, the big minerals that we're uh, having the, all together, they add up to about 4% of our body weight are sodium, chloride, calcium, phosphorus, sulfur, magnesium, and potassium. And these are ones that we've all been seeing as we've been talking about things. And then our trace elements, microminerals, which are in much, much, much smaller amounts, minute amounts. We have iron, which is probably the largest uh, one on this one, the greatest amount. Manganese, copper, iodine, cobalt, zinc, fluorine, selenium, and chromium. So that we do need a variety of minerals, and I'm sure you recognize these names as coming right off the periodic table. So just to end very briefly talking about healthy eating, you know, to have a healthy diet, you should be getting in enough energy and calories for your daily needs the essential fatty acids that you need, the essential amino acids that you need, and enough vitamins and minerals to support the growth and repair of body tissues. The requirements for any one person are difficult to determine because there's a whole bunch of things involved. How old are you? What gender you are? Are you growing? What kind of activity do you have? What sort of stress are you under? What's your you know, genetic background? Those all play into how, what types of food choices will work best for you. The government has given us recommended daily allowances, the RDAs that you find on food products, and we've got the USDA food pyramid as, as a picture for providing some guidance. And thankfully, you can now get a lot of in nutrition information and ingredients listed on most foods that you buy. So if you take the time to read the labels, you can find out a lot about what you're eating. I like this graphic picture. This is one from the Harvard Medical School. Um, the, you can find a MyPlate version from the USDA, but this one's just a little more particular. Um, what I like about this particular graphic is it says, look, if your plate is, you know, here's your dinner plate. Well, what's on your dinner plate? How much space is everything taking up? Are vegetables taking up most of the space? Uh, they can even take up to as much as half of it. You know, is protein only a little bit here? You don't have protein on half of your plate and a tiny little bit of vegetables in the corner. So it gives you a, a kind of a graphic picture that you can look at these um, sections on this uh, recommended plate and compare it to their, your own servings. It also promotes drinking water as your first beverage. Dairy uh, still is necessary, but you really only one to two servings a day. And juice, um, one glass of juice a day is, is really about all you need because there's not as much benefit in drinking juice as there is just eating a piece of fruit. So I like this particular way of, of suggesting how you put together your food choices. And then finally, malnutrition is poor nutrition that results from not having enough of those essential nutrients or a failure to be able to utilize them in your body. So you can be under you can have undernutrition by having a, not enough, a deficiency of essential nutrients, or you could, on the opposite side, actually be malnourished because you have too much of nutrient intake. And so you're in a situation where there is a, you, an imbalance on the other side. It's not enough. It's not that, that there's not enough nutrients, but there's too much. There's more than you need. And of course, we all know very well uh, that Americans in general are taking in too many calories in particular. They might be undernourished in some other of the essential nutrients, but they are overnourished in general in calories. Malnutrition can be a result of not getting enough food in the diet itself or that there are reasons why that diet is insufficient. And so in the next video, we'll be talking about some digestive disorders, and some of those can lead to malnutrition, but it's not because of the food choices. It's because of the inability to absorb them. So that finishes up what I wanted to talk about in nutrition and metabolism. There'll be one more video for this unit.